Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, zu diesem Crisis Talk hier in der hessischen Landesvertretung in Brüssel. Mein Name Welcome, ist ladies and gentlemen, to this Crisis Talk here in Hesse. I'm uh, here in uh, for the BDR in Brussels, and this is one of the best moments in my career, and therefore a right moment to have this Crisis Talk. We uh, do have Corona crisis. We have all the challenges. We are talking about the Brexit in Brussels, and we have a big discussion about the uh, state of law in uh, Hungary and Poland, and uh, therefore very good for our topic, 30 years of the German reunification and what happened and will happen for uh, past, present, and future. You can ask questions via mail on stream, streamline lv minus brussel, brussel dot hessen dot da, de. Or even uh, our hotline with the phone number you can see on the slide. In Belgium, 0032. And now I can announce a lady with which I woke up in the radio this morning because we were talking about the European Union uh, with Hungary and Poland. Uh, we are talking about Minister Lucia Putrich. She is a Minister for European Affairs. Uh, Mrs. Putrich, you have the floor, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to a very important event today from Hessen, uh, from the representation in Hesse. We uh, are talking about 30 years of reunification in Germany, but we are not looking back only on 30 years of German unity reunification, but we are looking back on uh, what was happening then. Uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain, but also the opportunity of enlargement of the European Union. What is our future? We had high expectations as far as the reunification was concerned, and I guess I can say this was right. Many of the expectations came through, but there are still some challenges we have to work on. We might have thought that the reunification in the heads of people would go ahead quicker. It was very quick at the heart, but we see that we have different stories, that we have, have different points of view, but we have a common goal. We want to have success in Germany as Germany reunited, and we want also to be successful as European Union. For this, we need exchanges, discussion, but also discuss point of views without losing the goal uh, to be successful in the international competition. I'm very happy that we have a very interesting panel here that we'll be discussing with you as uh, viewers can contact us. So a wholeheartedly welcome here in the representation of Hesse in Brussels. And I hope that very soon I can uh, greet you, not only digital, but also personally. Stay safe. Thank you, Mrs. Putrich. And I go further to another important European lady, Professor Nicole Deitel-Hoff. She is professor, but since four years, uh, she, she is in the Leibniz Institute uh, director and uh, um, also in the Foundation for Peace and Conflict Research and in the Research Center of Normative Order. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that I can greet you here from Frankfurt and also from our um, tech and research center for normative order and this in times of the pandemic that for us as Europeans is one of the biggest challenges in our history but also this 
pandemic should not take away our time to reflect uh, what has been done in the future and what in the future is still to do. We are talk about 30 years of reunification. This is a moment in which we should reflect what we did in this 30 years and what we will do in the next few years and what we still have to take away. I'm very happy that we have such an important uh, panel that will discuss with us. I would have loved to be with you, but I hope that I can uh, be very soon. And therefore, I wish you all a very good event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Seidelhoff. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if my children that haven't seen the GDR uh, ask me what can we uh, say about this uh, land country that is so far away, uh, we, we adapted, so the title, it was a bestseller in the eastern and western part of Germany, and therefore I have the pleasure to present you the author of this book, uh, Roland Jan. You know him as the representative uh, who is responsible for the documentation of the Stasi documents and I found different, def different definitions for him. Mr. Jan has a biography, and uh, if I compare it to my biography, uh, that is really um, exceptional. He was part of a group of, a group of young people uh, that were considered against the state. He was uh, in jail. Uh, they have put him on a train to bring him to Western Germany. There he had contact with the dissidents in uh, Eastern Europe. He brought cameras. His family uh, had to pay this uh, day where all, all his family was in jail and his father was an exceptional man. And uh, since 2011, he is the responsible 15,000 uh, big, uh, sex what, uh, uh, with this uh, documents and now he uh, had the opportunity to bring this in the federal archive and there are two points he said nobody should be condemned forever and but you need to know each other uh, especially uh, these documents from you have the floor uh, well I'm very happy to be here. Uh, 30 years of uh, the German unity, and uh, this is obviously a topic uh, that is very broad, and I would like to say shortly, and say also uh, something from my perspective, because the question is how would we live together in Europe, in our society, people and who, how they treat each other. And if you look at the documents of the Stasi, we are talking about human rights. Now the question of human rights is the bridge in between these times, in between um, the past, the present and the future, and therefore for Europe. And for me, the most important question is what does uh, freedom mean to us and self-definition and I guess it's a very good chance uh, that we can find an answer to uh, the moment when uh, Germany was divided therefore from before November uh, 1989 and we are still working on all this we are um, considering the history that is important for our society nowadays. It's also the history of the people who dared to uh, say no. They showed courage uh, and free country, free people. This was uh, a big poster that we have seen in 89 in Leipzig and uh, I was I saw these uh, the best uh, German television uh, 
and I I saw people uh, tear it up, uh, so I knew it will there will be an end. I already saw a new generation that didn't have fear. And uh, a month later, we had 70,000 people in the streets and the dictatorship was at the end. And in November, the, the wall came down, the Iron Curtain. And then this was the end with the GDR. And it's now 30 years that we are living in one open country with free people. And uh, what the young people said in 1989 um, is something I do remember. It was clearly against uh, oppression and for the state of law. And this wish is important, even nowadays. And when we had other um, things, uh, things were different from today. Uh, but uh, if we ask, which kind of uh, society do we want? Which, which kind of values do we need and want? And uh, therefore, the past can also remind us uh, how with different conditions our values can be uh, misled and not considered. And when I talk uh, with young people, uh, I hear that they can't imagine that we had uh, a wall with a border running through the German state, uh, the Europe uh, without borders. And these uh, words are uh, very strange today, uh, like Iron Curtain or the border. Therefore, for us, this is really uh, a request that we have to remind what happened and to explain it to the following generations in order to give these people an answer. Uh, if they ask, why, what, what should I do with this kind of history? And uh, for the following uh, generations, we should give them something. This should something that will give a plus value for their life. Liberty and human rights are not something we can always count on. We have to keep them up. This is hard work and remind can also help for our life nowadays, but it doesn't have to be it necessarily. This is not automatic. But we are all challenged to continue with this kind of dialogue. Uh, liberty and democracy are uh, even more important when we see what division meant for people. The whole people uh, was uh, included. Uh, they couldn't meet. And we have seen this in everyday life and with different situations. Now, if we wanted to refuse to adapt or say no, these are questions that many people in the GDR and under regimes in Eastern Europe uh, had to tackle with every day. Everybody had to find his way in dictatorship. And there are so many different stories, uh, especially uh, of one life. Uh, uh, all the system of Fear and oppression was not easy uh, to escape. It's like uh, venom, and uh, this has still an effect on the life and the reaction of people. The, um, the fear of the consequences, and also the the fear for the own family was something that was very important and obviously one had to adapt. And this was daily life in dictatorship. And still, we had people who had the courage to uh, try to fight against the dictatorship who found their own uh, ideas. And 
this uh, story has a lot of people and, and, and heroes with our names, and these uh, heroes with our name should be considered uh, uh, during this time. And uh, obviously, this is connected also to the inspiration uh, of the Eastern European countries, uh, uh, Solidarność in uh, in Poland, in Hungary, in the uh, in the nowadays Czech Republic, or then afterwards in the GDR. Uh, and we have to underline liberty and democracy are not a gift from the West. It's something where people had to fight for. And this is something we should consider when we talk about Europe today. Oh, first of all, the solidarity with the people that are still um, talking about op oppression or, or uh, we have, for example, also Russia, we have the activities of uh, activists uh, that we have to uh, back, uh, at least from a moral point of view. And if I see uh, uh, Belarus and, uh, and I see what happens there, then I see a parallel to, that, to what we have seen in the German Democratic Republic. And many of the methods that we find in all these documents. But there is a big difference in between at that time and today. We had uh, Gorbachev and now uh, see what happened to Russia. And therefore, it is important that we find in Europe uh, a connection to the values, uh, discussing them uh, every day, like we do here with uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Roland Jan. I'd like to introduce another member of our panel, uh, starting from Munich. He uh, is a professor for newer history at the Maximilian University in Munich, director of the Institute for Contemporary um, History, and uh, quite well known as well for uh, treating uh, the uh, history of the national socialism in Germany and talking about the uh, uh, afterwar period for both German states. Uh, Professor Wishing has written many books, uh, but he said uh, the prize for freedom at the Becker uh, uh, edition. So uh, this is the first history of that type, uh, especially since 1998 as well. The the prize for freedom, the prize for freedom. Uh, a lot of uh, daily papers have uh, reports. Uh, so the ivory tower of science, as they said uh, in the Augsburg Allgemeine paper, we talked about uh, the impact of uh, Joe Biden's uh, election victory for the EU, but consequences of the corona pandemic as well for our society, a society that until now was a society for integrated uh, supply chains and uh, freedom of movement and travel. Uh, so what does that mean, especially within the EU? Professor Vishay, most welcome uh, to our discussion round here. Good day to you. Microphone, please, please. You're just miming right now. You have to unmute your microphone, please. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot to unmute my mic. Thank you very much and good day to all of you and uh, to you as well, mm, Mr. Zina. So, hello, Professor Wishing. We just heard uh, oh, Roland Jan. Uh, Commemoration as a compass uh, for you as a historian, maybe a heresy question. If we have uh, a look at uh, history, at uh, German history, at uh, GDR history, and we talk about it, will that not reinforce the strangeness of it all? Uh, and after 30 years of German reunification being on today's topic, uh, shouldn't we say, okay, enough of that, enough research, enough studying of uh, Stasi uh, uh, files, let's have a look at the future now. Well, history and the present time and future are always interlinked. Uh, this is always the, the case. So the final line to be drawn is not really possible. History teaches us that uh, history is uh, uh, camping uh, on uh, people's backs. Uh, 
uh, in order to have a, a quotation of the kind uh, adapted to this situation, uh, there's an ambivalent uh, impact. Uh, history can give you um, orientation as well, indicate uh, wrong developments of the past, uh, maybe prepare positive uh, and reorientation uh, events that could be useful now that were overlooked at the time. History can do all that, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, seen in uh, different uh, books as well, uh, this can be a hindrance as well, leading in a wrong direction as well, because they're deeply rooted uh, in the past, uh, narratives are all brought up, uh, we call that narratives in the research, uh, uh, narratives are becoming uh, present again, and we're going to liberate ourselves on this. So today, today's Europe and today's Germany, um, we all uh, have uh, societies uh, that are also split up, divided by different uh, understandings of the past, uh, leading to possible new uh, conflicts in the future as well. This is a diagnostic uh, that we have to bring up here, unfortunately, and we cannot escape that. We cannot simply escape history. We have a pr more productive uh, uh, treatment of the whole matter, and this includes research and um, public handling of history as well. Professor Wishing, you travel a lot in Germany, Eastern and Western Germany, and a lot of people say we have the impression that if we um, have a look at the, uh, the uh, 30 years of uh, since the German unification, a lot of people have uh, the impression that Aussies and Vessies, uh, as they are called, are not getting c closer to each other, but uh, being mere divided. I hope that Mr. Jan shares my opinion. I am uh, from uh, West Germany. Uh, but today and in 1990, it's not simply a uh, history between East and West and that uh, the West uh, has been playing the major role and continues to do so. It's not a misunderstanding only between uh, East and West, but there's uh, differences of opinion within the Eastern European society as well. And there's uh, inter-West uh, divisions as well. In 1990, they existed as well. So this uh, contradiction between uh, East and West that's uh, being evoked again and again is is not really covering the, the, the matter as such. Uh, but we have to say as well that uh, this um, feeling in the eastern part of Germany, uh, as it's being said, uh, that their life performance is not sufficiently recognized in the reunification process until this very day. The positioning in the elites, uh, equal pay in public service and other topics are being brought up again and again. All of them factors that uh, give food for thought and uh, the impression amongst the Eastern uh, German uh, population that are not really feeling at home in this new Germany. And this is an intergenerational matter as well. Uh, there's differences uh, there as well. Uh, in 1990, people at that time had really a feeling of loss. Uh, the de-industrialization that was enforced in a lot of sectors uh, without uh, moving into a toy hunt, uh, bashing the fiduciary that had to manage all that. Uh, but a feeling of loss uh, has been the case in all post-communist uh, countries. And uh, this is part of history of a whole generation and an intergenerational transition transmission of the problem uh, to the upcoming uh, generations and we have to cope with this in a new way but still uh, as compared to 30 years ago Mr. Jan uh, um, Professor Wersching called upon you maybe for you another question uh, are we strangers uh, to each other an image that uh, keeps coming to my mind uh, shows uh, the uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel in Dresden in front of the Semper Oper and uh, the federal president, Gauck, at the time, both uh, are being really uh, good and uh, uh, we hooted uh, in front of uh, the, the, the opera in East Germany. And they were both coming from East Germany. So a negative uh, reaction here for both being from Eastern Germany and still hooted. Well, uh, I'm in agreement with Professor Wishing and uh, the things he just formulated uh, in the sense uh, that Ost -West, Eastern and Western uh, oppositions are being brought up, uh, although they're not really East-West uh, oppositions. Uh, the image that you just uh, drafted for us uh, is uh, quite... Uh, 
click that. So two um, leading personalities of German society uh, with East German history uh, hooted by East Germans uh, because they established themselves in the common Germany, in the reunified Germany and other things that, uh, that uh, they uh, came off badly because they are um, East Germans. So you have to say, that especially the 90s, uh, well, uh, have created a climate or certain political interest groups have uh, brought uh, this up. Uh, so criticism against this political system of the GDR was a criticism against uh, all the population's biographies. And so people tried to uh, indicate here that when an uh, East-West uh, conflict should be brought up to explain all this. But a lot of the problems we have right now have nothing to do with this, uh, especially when uh, structural question, questions are concerned, uh, especially when uh, certain behaviors during elections uh, are concerned. Uh, so uh, we can uh, see that the comments in the media are simplified, uh, addressing certain things, whereas uh, statistics do not cover this at all. And another element of importance, in my view, uh, having a look at biographies as well, I used to live uh, 30 years uh, in the GDR and was brought forcibly to West Germany. And uh, I'm someone from the Eastern German or the Western German part. And I said, uh, I'm a German uh, and that's it. So in the GDR context, 4 million people moved from east to west in the last 30 years. The four additional million people did the same move after reunification. So they changed homes between east and west. And uh, you can see that uh, this separation uh, cannot be called uh, as such anymore. Think about all the young people in their 20s. They went from Cologne to Dresden for studies. They've been living there for 30 years now. And they're still considered as Vessies. People from the West uh, are people from East moving to West are still Aussies uh, and uh, people from the East. Uh, and so the scientific research here that's taking place concerning uh, disadvantages for Eastern uh, or Western Germans in the respective other part of the country. Well, uh, here we have to see that in the public debate, this is uh, misinterpreted fully. Uh, and after a study of the University of Leipzig, uh, for instance, uh, it's indicated that uh, there's uh, not enough uh, leading staff in uh, state side um, institutions. Uh, if you have a look at the definition, the definition of people from the east or the west, I used to live there for 30 years, uh, and I'm certainly not uh, considered as someone from the east. Uh, Mrs. Merkel was born in uh, Hamburg, but grew up in uh, Eastern Germany. Mrs. Giffey, uh, prime minister, or the primary minister, always brought up from the SPD, the Social Democrats, uh, uh, um, is not uh, considered uh, in the um, eastern German uh, statistics either. So, uh, for me, it is important at least uh, that, um, well, you will integrate uh, in all this uh, um, overview historical lines that have to be drawn back uh, to the initial industrialization of certain parts of Germany to, that took place uh, way before the GDR period. Uh, or the transformation of the last 30 years as well, or um, other questions as well uh, of uh, life uh, in a dictatorship, uh, which goes beyond, way beyond the GDR, when you talk about certain mentalities, certain cultures that you have to have a closer look at. Mm. Uh, about the um, cohabitation uh, of civil society, for instance. All these are um, things uh, that uh, are just in a certain parts linked to the present history and uh, history, past, present, future, have to be brought together to understand uh, the full image. Uh, I have a question here from one of our spectators, uh, Mr. Hahn, working in the House of European History here at the Park Leopold in Brussels as a guide, Dr. Kurt Geisel. And uh, the question for Roland Jan is uh, from when onwards uh, did you really believe in the German unification when uh, the borders were opened up between um, Austria and Hungary already uh, in the summer of uh, 89? Well, I believed in the German reunification uh, quite uh, consciously since 1987. Linked to what I mentioned already, the question um, that uh, my um, division between East and West could be solved only by global German thoughts. 
the whole of German. And uh, in that sense, I've been working on this uh, to put uh, to drill some holes in the wall to start with and then to uh, let the wall tumble down and to come finally to reunify uh, Germany. That was something that uh, I had quite consciously um, on my mind since 1987, the first steps to get there. And the final uh, reality was a sentence for me from a member of the Central Committee of the um, SED, Otto Reinhardt for, in the GDR, said in an interview with the Deutschlandfunk at the time, what is there... Uh, a justification for the existence of the GDR when there is a democratization uh, in the sense of the Federal Republic of Germany. There's no right to exist. And uh, uh, this sentence, um, uh, a quote from December 87, indicated that what a lot of uh, um, civil rights campaigners wanted a reformed GDR, but still an independent GDR. Uh, supported uh, by the ideas of those uh, being in the opposition at that time, uh, that such a reform GDR will not take place. Uh, a peaceful development rather to the German unification and no other chance to have uh, uh, another solution and to be reunified as quickly as possible. And when the demonstrations uh, uh, took place, uh, when people said, uh, uh, if the D mark, the German, uh, the West German uh, mark, uh, come doesn't come to 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 us, we will go there. Uh, and the uh, framework conditions in the GDR should at least have uh, been changed, allowing them to uh, have a, a real path uh, to reunification and make it feasible. Thank you, Mr. Jan. Uh, same question now to Professor Wersching, if I may. Did you have a certain moment in time when you thought, well, it might uh, succeed this time, um, um, a moment you remember? Well, what Mr. Jan just said that uh, there was a lot of skepticism concerning an uh, individual and independent GDR identity in the case of uh, an agreement on uh, freedom of movement and uh, uh, it was quite abstract. Even in 1987, I would never have thought uh, that uh, the German reunification would be uh, foreseeable in just two years at a time. So opening up of the borders from uh, Hungary to Austria in uh, May um, in was uh, uh, a first step, and then the uh, waves of refugees as well, the cause of 89, are indicating quite clearly that the SED regime in the GDR was not, and that was the decisive element, uh, not being supported any longer by the Soviet Union. The erosion processes that took place and the opposition processes against the SED regime, they were well known. Uh, as a Western observer, you knew about that as well. You didn't uh, have to go back until uh, 1953 for that, but the SED regime, and so actually all communist uh, dictatorships in the Eastern Bloc uh, uh, were uh, based on the bayonet uh, mm, uh, approach. Uh, that was quite well known. Uh, I never really believed in an individual identity of the GDP without, without, without being a radical anti-communist, uh, but there was an erosion potential brought up anyways. Uh, and as soon as as uh, the primary power under Gorbachev uh, ended the support, and uh, Gorbachev has a very important role in the whole process, of course. And uh, this support function was not given any longer, and then you could you had a little idea. In the summer of 89, you could see specifically that a reunification uh, might become possible. Professor Wishing, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to um, introduce our uh, discussion. We are connected to Professor Dr. Danuta Hübner, first Polish Commission of the European Union in the years 2004 to 2009. Professor um, Hübner, uh, since uh, 2009, you're a member of European Parliament uh, and uh, in uh, the, the um, hallways of the European Parliament, what's going on? Where are decisions being made? Uh, uh, what about the Brexit? Uh, a lot of people say, ask uh, Professor Dr. Hübner, she would know. Since uh, the 19th member of the, the Committee for um, International Trade, uh, uh, Trade and uh, uh, Currency as well, and uh, for the think tank, Wilfred Mart, set of European Studies, you're writing about digitization as well, but uh, in the situation uh, of the EU right now and the relevance of the German unification for the European Union today. 
Today, we have the situation that uh, Poland and Hungary are being discussed uh, concerning elements of uh, rule of law. Poland and Hungary are right now uh, blocking the uh, European budget with all the consequences for the recovery fund uh, linked to that. Uh, what is your position now uh, for someone knowing the country uh, quite well and knowing the EU Commission and Brussels as well? What would be your recommendation? Should, be, should we be rather relaxed? German, so I and I don't have translation, so I don't know how we are going to solve it. But I would, if you ask me questions, you will have to do it in English. Sorry, I, I appreciate very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I've been, I, I really need it in English. Sorry. I've been translating the whole time. I've been translating the whole time. Can you hear me, Mrs. Hübner? You have to switch on the English channel. English channel. Commissioner, EU Commissioner, our question uh, concerning Poland and Hungary. What is your recommendation right now? Should we just Differences sorry, I, I can't. The, the translation. I'm sorry. The the quality is very bad. I just hear every force of your sentence of what you are saying. So I understand you are asking about the current situation with regard to the veto by Hungary and Poland and how how I see the chances for getting out of this uh, of this uh, sort of difficult situation. If that's correct. Yeah. Because you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first yeah, of all, time. thank you. Yes. You're right. That's, Thank you. Thank you very much for, first of all, for the invitation and uh, to, to all of you. And I welcome uh, very much the, the fact that you are doing it also in, in Brussels. And I think that uh, this invitation for me has been very important because I always believe that uh, the, uh, the re reunification of or the fall of the Berlin Wall has been one of the most important events in the modern European uh, history. But now in all the introduction, remarks there has been the word crisis used uh, very often and I think it, in, indeed we are very deeply in all of us as the, in the global context as well and there is no place to hide and that's why I think the only solution is to be together to try to get out of the uh, of the problem uh, together and for me uh, personally I would say that the the fall of Berlin Wall the unification of Germany has been always a big important symbol of being together in, in Europe. And that's why I, I think that uh, talking Europe and uh, um, uh, today in the context of your uh, uh, 30 years of reunification is something that is just correct and right. And that's how we uh, do it. Because I think in the meantime, also the new generations have arisen and they do not, some of them in Europe, I'm not talking about Germans, but some of them in Europe might not even have today um, as a point of uh, reference uh, to Germany. It's just every, uh, I think the younger generations already, I, I think, uh, have unified Germany as an obvious point of reference for the way of thinking, for the way they see also uh, Europe. So I, I, I fully agree with you that what we celebrate now is just not an important moment of unification, but but what we celebrate today is also the the vibrancy, the dynamism of modern Germany, but also of modern Europe, of their people, their democratic commitment, they also strong pro-European stand. And, and I also think that or also moral backbone in confronting the, the challenges of our uh, time. So I, I wanted to say is in my introductory remarks that when we respect the memory, which I think is extremely important, actually we celebrate what is now and we look uh, towards what should be should be done um, uh, to, to shape the future of Europe in a way that would uh, uh, fulfill our dreams and our expectations and also our, our needs. Uh, and uh, I also think that regarding your, your question, it's one of the big issues today. Uh, we live with it, not only in Brussels, I would say, but I think because of the way we handle the the budgetary issue, uh, the way we reform Europe on this occasion of uh, looking uh, for financing also of the needs to for the recovery 
And also, I think the, the things that are happening in the sense of not having unity in Europe, this is, I think, of great interest also to ordinary citizens, because we tend to keep this budgetary issue, budgetary challenges and the veto at the level of the discussion among politicians, among governments, but actually it's all about people and it's about the, the needs uh, related to their health, their life, uh, they, they also jobs, uh, first of all, if I can say very important also for the future. And it also is a moment where we test our solidarity in Europe. We test also the trust that we have and that we need. So all I can say is that I really hope that we will find a, a solution, a way out of this, of this issue. I am actually ashamed that uh, we, uh, on this occasion, where we are really looking for uh, uh, solutions that are absolutely related to the basics of our survival, that we are entering into this type of the discussion. I think it's absolutely clear it is not against Poland, it is not against Hungary, it is an instrument which is very important for the future when our budgets, our availability of public funds in Europe will be much bigger. And that's why I think it's important that we all uh, respect also in this context everything that is uh, in the treaties, everything that has been the basis for our accessions in different moments to the European uh, Union. And I think this is also the the basic, the foundation for the trust, if we, uh, for all of us, uh, if we, when we respect or we not respect uh, the fundamental um, principles of European integration. So I see it as a, in a more general terms as extremely important also that today we finalize what was started in 2018, this new approach to have also the European values related to the budget that we finalize it today. So I hope that Poland and Hungary will understand the importance of it. And I also hope that we will stop sort of looking um, at it, we in Poland, that we stop looking at it in the context of, of uh, seeing it as a kind of weapon against, um, uh, against uh, uh, sort of elected member states. I think it's for all of us to feel safe with our financing in, in Europe, and also to remind us that, yes, there are values, yes, there are principles, there is a, a legal framework which we all have to respect, because Europe is a community of law, and uh, so I look at it more this way, and that's why I trust that uh, we will find and that we will not have a deeper crisis because of lack of solution to this uh, issue. Unfortunately, if I can add, it is all now in the council. I mean, it's now an issue among member states, so they have to find a, a solution. But I can tell you, we had also today discussions in the European Parliament, uh, that Parliament is not prepared to give up on this important link to the European values and uh, principles um, uh, that we have uh, been sort of working on for uh, more than two years now. Äh, Frau Professor Höfner, gestatten Sie mir eine kurze Nachfrage, einfach um Ihr Land Polen zu verstehen. Polen. Please allow me a question uh, to understand Poland also, because Poland is the country that gets most of uh, the financing. Aus dem Corona Wiederaufbaufonds. And Und they receive also uh, the biggest part from the Corona uh, funding. Why is Poland blocking? that household. What is Kaczynski up to? Uh, do they want to leave the European Union or do they want the money without the rule of law? Um, you mentioned also the, the you, you try to understand why, why this thing is, is happening because Poland indeed is the biggest beneficiary. Historically, uh, we are the member state that has been um, benefiting from the European funding since uh, before the uh, the accession, I can tell you it's highly appreciated. I can also tell you that if you look at Poland today and um, 20 years ago or 30 when we started uh, uh, our um, transition to market economy and democracy, the, the change thanks to the European Union, thanks to the fact that we were smart enough to understand how important it is to join the European Union, I think Poland 
has benefited enormously, and I think Poland has changed uh, enormously. If you if you look at at uh, even at the sort of at how small cities, which used to be the uh, the most uh, neglected and abandoned uh, places in the previous uh, previous decades before the uh, transition and accession to the European Union, so nobody is questioning it, and I think people are appreciating uh, it. So uh, I think any politicians that now are just playing the games or are now just um, using this argument of putting the values on, on, on one side and the um, money on the other side, uh, is, is, this is just cynical. I don't approve of it. And I would like to underline very strongly, it is not Poland that is doing it. It is not on behalf of most of us. I think most of us would never... Uh, support this type of uh, approach. And I'm not saying it to, to just to please anybody. I'm just saying it because I think deeply in uh, polls, majority of polls are, are really just extremely happy with the fact that we are finally really within the European framework, that we are also within the whole system where we can also contribute uh, to make Europe uh, stronger. And, and this is so if somebody, if politicians use this fact to, 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 to kind of blackmail uh, the, in using this, uh, this money issue, money for values or values for money, whichever way it goes, this is something which is unacceptable to most of us in Poland. And I, uh, I think that um, uh, that's why I think there is this sort of political dimension to it. Uh, also, the internal situation in Poland is probably behind that to a certain extent. But uh, I, I think we, we, we will find a way out of it as Europe, because I think it's uh, Poland, whether you like it or not, we are part of Europe. And, and we have been also committing, uh, committed to, to make Europe stronger over the last years. And uh, uh, I think that um, uh, this crisis will have to be uh, somehow sort of solved, but there are risks. There is a risk that the money will come later than we would expect it. We cannot afford it. We, we know the situation also in Poland. I think we are in a uh, in a deep sort of second wave uh, uh, situation uh, also. So we need also support of the new funding that we, we want to have more uh, health uh, funding in European budget. It's for all of us, I think, across Europe. We have many countries that need it. So we need this budget and we need uh, with the new policies and new funds. And we need also the recovery, this revolution in Europe, what we used to be taboo. Now we uh, have also the possibility of um, having a collective bond, European bond, and getting more money from the European market. So this is also for, uh, for us very important that this momentum for the reform, uh, which was difficult for years, impossible actually for years, that this momentum is kept and that uh, we will find agreement uh, on, on how to combine really uh, the respect of uh, all the rules, uh, rule of law in particular, with the uh, efficient use of European funding. Thank you very much, uh, Danuta Hübner. Um, Herr Professor, uh, ich würde Sie gerne Professor, fragen, wenn Sie die Situation heute sehen. When you are looking at the situation, we have the influence on uh, the reunited Germany uh, on the European uh, Union. Germany has the uh, Zusammenhängt blockieren. The Deutsch. semester. And now we have a block. Now the German, uh, as uh, somebody who tries to Bismarck, bring Bismarck. things ahead, uh, if we look at the German Reich and Bismarck, um, how many money has been paid because everybody was against it. And Today, we have a similar situation. Poland and Hungary are fighting against it. They can't use the force that was used under Bismarck. What should Germany do? How should Germany react? What would you say? Uh, as you said, we are in a really difficult situation. And I uh, listened carefully to what uh, Professor Hübner said. I can't believe that this is really the majority 
Poland, because we have seen this also in the last elections, there were a lot of, a lot of anti-European slogans, and uh, uh, therefore we had also this majority. Well, uh, at least this is something we should uh, discuss, because I have the impression that Poland is divided in between the rural places and the cities. Uh, all the other uh, countries uh, uh, that uh, seem uh, to be divided are our problem nowadays. And the German people have one uh, challenge uh, they have to tackle with the European unification or European Union work when the national states have the impression that they can when this, uh, uh, have the best out of the European Union um, with their models. Uh, if we have a flourishing country and a flourishing Europe, then we can do something together. And we see this since 1950, 1980, then especially. And there are so many things about the European values and so on and so forth, but the structure has to be that we have complementary interests in das order to bring the country ahead. And this after 1990 uh, up to 2004, this was the case and Poland is part of Europe. We do know that, we knew that at that time, that's clear, but the European models to serve their own interests uh, in order to have uh, a particular policy. This is something we have lost and uh, we shouldn't hide that. Polen, was die Regierungspolitik betrifft. And uh, as far as the government policy is concerned in Hungary and Poland, uh, this is clear because uh, it's the zweite. And you say the European unification is the second point. And now we have the rule of law, and that's very interesting to see uh, and to consider if the European people will be uh, capable sage ich mal dass auch in ungarn und in polen to tackle things in a certain way uh, so that poland and hungary will understand that the european models might at the end be very important and also the best one because there is also a lot of money involved but this is for me still an open question einer anderen vorstellung and therefore the veto because uh, there People wanted uh, another uh, point of view. Now, the German people with their influence and with uh, their financial strengths, uh, when uh, the German people uh, were allowing to take debts, because for many years this was taboo in, in, in German politics, this is very, a very important step. Uh, uh, thanks to this recovery plan. and now we have to see what will happen if we really have a broad acceptance in the European member states and this is what is best for everybody. The future is uh, now uh, yeah, uh, still not clear uh, shortly. Uh, Mrs. Merkel is calling you. Uh, I have to tackle this problem tomorrow. What would you uh, counsel um, or recommend uh, uh, with what happened in Poland and in Hungary? Uh, rule of law. Uh, would you say this is the moment in which we decide uh, the, the, the future of the European Union? Europäer und als Staatsbürger fragen würde ich zum Hartz. If you ask me as a citizen, I will stay strong. This is a topic we are not talking about only a few days. It, it developed during the year and the European Union faktisch Tendenzen zu finanzieren. Can't allow to finance tendencies that are not. Uh, in, 
Das ist das äh, Privileg, das ist in the way we wanted it to be. Uh, but this is now the good point because I'm a historian and therefore I don't have to take political decisions. Anyhow, uh, we can try to give some orientation from history, but the decisions uh, are not clear uh, beforehand. Uh, and I would recommend to stay strong. So I ask Mr. Jan, somebody who uh, followed for the rule of law and uh, who lived with uh, all these problems. Uh, uh, would you be, stay strong or would you uh, I open up and uh, this, uh, you understand, you do not need to accept it. Uh, it's very difficult, like all why these people are thinking in a certain way and why they have uh, different interests and this gives us the opportunity if ever to uh, build a bridge uh, I said very clearly the basis are uh, human rights the basic rights uh, and this is something we uh, decided upon and Therefore, the member states here uh, decided the values of a common approach. The basis, and these values are the basis, the basis of the European Union. We can talk uh, and discuss about the rest, but these values can't uh, be hit. And this is also true for international politics, we have standards in Europe uh, and in politics as far as the social questions are concerned, and we can't go against the human rights when something is happening in other uh, third countries, uh, and we have to do this even if we might have a financial loss. Uh, we do need a basis from which we can go ahead with the discussion. And we have uh, it's in the interest of the national states langfristig gedacht wird, ne? uh, to have a longer view. Because if you think about the national states, that democracy is as good as she is treating minorities. Uh, so if the government think that they need structures to uh, guarantee their power, well, then things might happen with the next election and be negative for those who uh, decided this way. And this is also what we have in the European Union. Uh, things that are important in Poland and Hungary uh, where They think they might go ahead with certain things, but this is also the reason for me why it is important to have this uh, ground, this fundament. And quickly to Mrs. Hübner, a short answer. Will Poland and Hungary stay in the European Union? Do you think there will be an agreement upon that? Meine Damen und Herren, ich höre gerade, dass die Leitung äh, zu Danuta Hübner unterbrochen ist. Ich darf hear that Mrs. Hübner is not um, with us anymore and I can therefore close the crisis talk and uh, the next event is tomorrow, the 19th of November at 11, 15th anniversary uh, Security and Defense College. Thank you very much for being here and thank you for uh, your attention here in the representation of Hesse. See you soon. Ja, Goodbye. Dankeschön. Thank Bitte you. Schon.